Well, incredible. Uh, today is another great one on That's Classic. Uh, we have somebody on that. I'm telling you, the word fascinating, that applies to this gentleman, without a doubt. I mean, absolutely amazing. I, I have to tell you, he played uh, Richard Rickover on, uh, he was Beaver's best friend on Leave it to Beaver. He uh, also co-created Hannah Montana, and he has this incredible display called Icons of Darkness. I mean, I'm telling you, it goes the gamut here. So uh, anyway, Rick, what a pleasure to have you on. Rich. Thanks. I'm glad, I'm <laughs> I love glad. I said Rick. <laughs> I'm glad. That's okay. I'm glad to be here, John. Oh, well, fantastic. So I'll tell you what, to start out, how did you, um, how did you end up getting the role of, of Richard Rickover to begin with? Because I read a lot of stuff. I know that your family was tight with the creator, Joe Conley. Right. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> excuse me, my dad was obviously really tight with Conley because Conley and Mosier had been head writers on the Amos Nandy radio show. Mm -hmm. uh, they were friends for years. But when Larry Mandela was being phased out of Leave it to Beaver, and this was kind of mid-season three, um, they started looking for a kid to kind of replace Larry. Uh, Gilbert, Steve Talbot, had already been there. Whitey he was already there. So they were kind of looking for a main guy to replace Larry. So I actually went on a call. Um, Conley said to my agents, bring in Rich, because we saw some stuff he did. But he didn't say, oh, we'll just give him that part. I had to go in and audition with everybody else. So I went and auditioned. They liked the audition. So I came in to do the first three shows that I was there for. One of them called <laughs> the Spot Removers. That's, that's pretty heavy with Richard and Beaver. But... While all this was going on, I think the Conley and Mosier had decided to, rather than have Beaver just have one kid replaced, to kind of bring all the kids in. So Gilbert would have a lot of screen time and Whitey would, I would. So I came, I became kind of this group of his friends and we would do individual shows sometimes and then we would do show all, shows all together. But that's how it happened. But I went on a casting call just like I would for any of the shows that I was doing because I had done you know, Love That Bob, The June Allison Show, Bonanza, um, The Detectives. I did a bunch of stuff before I did Beaver. So I was just one of those kids that goes on an audition. You go into kind of a cattle call and there's 12, 13, 14, 20 kids. And I didn't know if I had gotten it or not, you know. And then when I got it, I thought, this is going to be great. But I didn't know if it would be reoccurring or just a couple episodes or what. And one of the reasons that I think it was reoccurring is because Jerry and I, I'm about two weeks older than Jerry. Wow. The same size, <clears throat> like the same stuff. He wanted to sit next to me in the schoolroom. And we just had so much fun away from the set. <laughs> Sorry, and behind the scenes that I think the producers went, well, Jerry's having a great time. The parents are great. You know, Conley likes Charlie Carell. He's coming down the set to watch to be Rich's guardian. It just worked out that way. But I think there was a lot behind the scenes that kind of kept me there, not just the stuff that's in front of the scenes. I got you. And uh, just, you know, for my audience, they, just so they know, when he says uh, Charlie Carell, uh, he's talking about his father, who was Andy Brown of Amos and Andy, which is, you know, it, they, they're still famous to this day. So uh, that is a big deal that he was coming down and he was there for you and he was on the set. That's pretty cool. Did that yeah, mean a lot father, to you? Sorry about the cough. My father... Okay. Um, was did Amos and Andy? Amos and Andy started in 1928, and wow. so it went. It was on it, for 33 years. It was like in the top 10 most popular radio shows, and for like 10 of those years, it was like number one. So they were huge, huge radio stars. But my dad's career was winding down. They were doing the Amos and Andy Music Hall, which started in 1955, and then that ended in '60. So just at the end of '60, actually. Almost mm -hmm. at 61. So after my dad was kind of retired, he thought it was fascinating to come on set and be with me. And that was really fun. So, you know, Joe Conley would come down to set to give notes and end up sitting and talking to my father for 20 minutes, which was great. <laughs> so that was, yeah. And having my father with me, my father should have been my grandfather because when I was born, he was 58. But he was always totally supportive, a really good guy. And my parents were terrific because they never said, oh, you should be in show business. They just said, are you having fun? 
Did you I like love it? So if I wanted to do something else, they would have been fine. But that was for me, it was fun. I had a lot of, as a matter of fact, people ask me about Beaver all the time. And the truth is we were like paid for having fun. Because <laughs> we were just, I mean, Universal, there, there wasn't any Universal tour. So we had that place to ourselves. It was terrific. I mean, we, well, we would commandeer golf carts and run around the back lot and stuff. Oh my gosh. So, so running around, just so I get a visual on this, is it you and uh, Jerry Mathers and, uh, whitey like you know uh, steve talbot like running around where you like kind of like a you know just steve free talbot is was and is a great guy he played gilbert oh and, Gil gilbert i'm sorry i'm I his I, father yeah. lyle talbot was also a very 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 accomplished actor the guy made so many movies oh yeah <laughs> the, the first tv show i ever did which was love that bob king donovan played my dad and lyle talbot was in the show as bob's best friend so I was like in good company. And I, I knew Lyle Talbot before I knew Steve Talbot. But Steve Talbot was another really, really good guy. Lots of fun, fun to hang out with. You know, we were just, it was like a, a group of kids that were all friends. Stanley Fafaro, who played Whitey, he was another good guy. And Barbara Billingsley, obviously June Cleaver, she was like our den mother. She was like such a nice person, just the nicest person. So, I mean, going to stage and doing that show was just lots of fun. But as you mentioned, would you guys, would it, would it be the three of you? I mean, anytime there were a group of us working in between lunchtime or when we were shooting, or, I mean, we were very professional. We had to know sure. our lines, we had to be on stage, we had to go to school, we couldn't goof off like that. But the fact that we were always kids running around, we were responsible, but we had a blast. So Steve is a great guy. I really, really always liked Steve. I still really like him. Um, and we just had, I mean, you know, I'd show up and here was Jerry, Steve, Stanley. Everybody was like, hey, let's go do something. It was the best. We knew our <laughs> lines. The director said, okay, guys, cut. Go back to school. We'd have our school and we'd have time. It's like, go, let's go run around. It was cool. It was so, it was so much fun. Well, you know, I've had Jerry on the show, and it, which he is a terrific guy. And having had the opportunity to meet him a couple of times, <clears throat> he just is. He's just a great guy. And, um, one thing that Jerry had mentioned is that he would actually go fishing sometimes in the pond that was at Universal. Did you guys do stuff like that? Were you like out there just, you know, because it sounds like, like what in a, like, I'm so jealous. I can't even tell you like that idea of running around Universal at that time would have been just a dream. Well, I mean, we did all kinds of different stuff that kids would want to do. Uh, again, we, you know, we wouldn't vandalize things or be crazy <laughs> because we were professional kids. Sure. But it's this, I mean, it, we did what kids did. You know, we were 10 and 9, 10, 11, 12. What do kids want to do? They all want to run around. You know, it's like, so we, we always had a really good time. And the parents were really nice. You know, Steve's parents were great. My dad and mom were terrific. I loved the Mathers. I loved uh, Norman and Marilyn Mathers. They were, I mean, see, Jerry and I became so close. You know, he would come to my house on a Friday and stay the whole weekend. And then I'd go to his house. We'd trade off. And this was had nothing to do with the show. This was us, you know, making models, running around and playing football. And it was great. We really had fun. And you know, you know by the way, the fact yeah. that we were universal running around, that's what started me on this sci-fi fantasy and horror collecting. That's how because of the, the monsters of like Universal. <laughs> yeah, we Bob Don was our makeup man. Bob Don was Jack Don's brother. Jack Don was the head of the department. And, you know, Bob had worked, you know, there's lots of pictures of him building the creature from the Black Lagoon. And, mm. and, and he built the, the the head from Psycho. Jerry actually got to put strands of hair on Mrs. Bates's head. Oh, wow. So that's kind of stuff. But we kept bugging him saying, look, you know, we want to go to the makeup lab. We want to go to the makeup lab. Because, you know, we on Friday night, you'd watch Shock Theater in Los yeah. Angeles. And they bought the Universal package. So. Here were the Wolfman and the Dracula and the mummies, you know, and we knew it all came from Universal. So we kept saying, let's go up there. Let's go up there. Come on, come on, come on. So finally he took us up there and it was so cool. All the stuff we saw, but they were throwing all this stuff in the trash. What? They would keep stuff for like, you know, six, seven years and go, eh. They threw the land suit from the creature from the Black Lagoon in a dumpster. Because they said, oh, nobody, we can't use it. It's rotten, which it really wasn't. But let's throw it out. Now, at auction today, 
that's worth about a million seven. Oh my God. And they threw it in the trash, right in the trash. If you'd fished it in the trash, you'd have a million dollars. Oh my God. Now I, I, I saw you in an interview where you said that you actually picked out the mask from Abbott and Costello. Uh, I think it was Dr. Maybe it was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It was, it was. Unreal. What, how did that happen? It was sitting in the trash. I thought someone was going to throw like coffee on it or something. And I said to this guy, can I take it? Yeah, go ahead and take it. And it was one of the half masks that Karloff wore. Oh, wow. I still have that, by the way. Oh, my gosh. Come on. Yeah, it's like so old. It's like mummy dust, but it's under glass. Oh, is that cool? That is so cool. I mean, I, I can't even tell you. I, I, I've i like goosebumps just thinking about that. What Now, did you get to know any of the, um, you know, like Karloff or Peter Lorre, any, anybody like that? Were they around even at that time or not? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that. Um, I lived in this fancy, smancy house that my, <laughs> that my father had over in um, Homeby Hills. Mm -hmm. um, they, my parents used to entertain all the time. And as kids, if we came downstairs to go to the parties, we had to wear a suit and tie. Oh, wow. And I didn't like wearing a suit and tie. We had to wear a suit and tie to go on a plane. To go to mm -hmm. Sometimes if we went with our parents to the movies and sat in loges, we'd have to have a suit and tie. We had to have a suit and tie to go to the go to church, go to the go to the parties at the house. And my father said to me, and I was like 10, I guess. He said, I want you to come down to the party tonight. Because I didn't always go downstairs, you know, to do that. And I went, nah, Dad, come on, I don't want to dress up. And he said, No, 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 come to the party. I went, no. And he said, Look, just come to the party. I mean, he was very insistent. And I thought, I wonder what's up here. So when I went downstairs, the first person I saw was Ralph Edwards. You remember him from this? Oh, is of course. Your uh, th th this is your life. And Ralph Edwards's best friend was Boris Karloff. And I looked over and sitting at the bar in our home was Boris Karloff and his wife. And I was like, oh, oh. this is why my dad wanted me to be there because he knew I was crazy about this stuff. And yeah. I went, oh my God. You know, I walked up to him. I walked up to Karloff and I said, Mr. Karloff, it's so nice to meet you. I'm Richard Karloff. It was just like that. I mean, I was never a shy person. I was yeah, always, no, you're not a shy guy. No, no, I no. And I said, oh, by the way, how was it working with Bailey Lugosi? That's the first thing I asked him. And then I thought, oh my God, why did I ask him that? <laughs> and he was so sweet, completely British, really nice. What did he, he say? What did he say? Oh, he said, oh, working with Bela Lugosi was a lot of fun. I liked a lot of the movies we did together, especially Son of Frankenstein. And then, and it was this big room where there was a bar, a fireplace, <laughs> kind of like a dance floor. He took me over to the where the fireplace was between these two chairs. There was a chair on either side of the fireplace. He sat in one, I sat in the other. And for about 15, 20 minutes, he talked to me about Universal, Jack Pierce, The Mummy, doing the Frankenstein movies. Um, I, th this was before I had the head from uh, Jekyll and Hyde. I, I didn't have it yet. But he talked to me yeah. about a bunch of stuff. And then my mom kind of like came over to take him to dinner and kind of like said, I'm, you know, I'm going to extract him from because I, it would have been all night long. And yeah. then <clears throat> I thought it was so sweet. And then doing Leave it to Beaver, Jerry and I would go visit all the sound stages. And I got to tell you, Jerry was a huge TV star. I mean, I was kind of like a B player with him, but he he was really big. So mm -hmm. if he went on stage, like everybody knew who he was. So the signs that said closed set, they were never closed to him. So we went mm -hmm. to see them shooting Thriller. And we were there on a day when they were shooting wraparounds with Karloff. And we went up and talked to him again. And I said, oh, Mr. Karloff, um, I don't know if you remember, but I, you met me in my dad's house. Oh, yes, of course, of course. Now, I don't really know if he did remember, but he was so sweet. Yeah. You know? And then later, I went on the set of A Comedy of Terrors, the Roger Corman AIP film, and Karloff, Rathbone, Price, and Laurie were all there at one time. Oh, and whoa. I really in heaven. And I said it to him again. <laughs> Do you remember meeting me? Oh, of course. Yes, I remember coming there. And, and again, the nicest guy, I don't know if he remembered, but he was so sweet. And, you know, the furthest thing from a monster. But he, And by the way, Vincent Price was literally the nicest person in Hollywood. Vincent Price was a guy that would say to you, um, well, sit down and talk to me. Okay, so what school do you go to? And what are you studying? And what kind of TV shows do you like? And what do you, what do you think about this? And how do you uh, like, I mean, he was, 
he was, if you said hello to him, it wasn't, hi, how are you? Shake your hand. He yeah. wanted to know everything about you. He was sweet. He was great. Anyway, so I met Karloff for like at least three times. Um, Peter Laurie was on the set of Comedy of Terrors too. It's, it's close to the time, was, I think the second to last movie he made or something. Um, and I was with a guy named Norman, or sorry, Robert Foster, whose father, Norman Foster, was an actor and then a director who had directed a bunch of the Mr. Moto movies at Fox. Oh, totally. So we went up to talk to Lori, and you know, Robert had all this stuff to talk to him about. You know, my dad directed you. How, how, how is everything? And he was, you know, pretty nice about it. And I thought, well, this is my chance. So I said to him, I shook his hand. And I said, Mr. Lori, I got to tell you, I'm a huge fan of one of your movies. And I'm sure he thought I was going to say, you know, Mad Love, M, Casablanca. And mm -hmm. I said, what was that? And I said, The Beast with Five Fingers. And he went, oh, <laughs> that, that thing. And I was like, oops, what did I say? That? I love that. I still love that movie. That's a great movie. I still love that movie. And I thought, oh, I'm going to be, it's going to be so great. I can meet the guy that was a star and tell him how much I like it. And he was like, eh. <laughs> so I was like, whoops. So I didn't have a lot of interaction with Lori. Actually, I went to his funeral. Um, wow. I didn't have a lot of interaction with him, but we did have some. My father worked with him in the 40s. Said he was super nice, very organized, you know, knew his lines, really good guy. But Karloff, the best. He was the best. I met... Price, Rathbone, oh. Lori, Karloff, Cheney Jr., Christopher Lee. The only one I didn't meet was Lugosi because he died in 56. I was too young. Yeah. I wouldn't have had a chance to meet him. And of all of those guys, the first horror movie I saw on TV was Dracula, which really scared me. That You know, the shots of him with the lights in his eyes. Oh, big time. It's really still crazy. Me. I always loved Lugosi. And I understand about his career and that his problems in life and all this stuff. But I always loved him. I I I, act, I asked most of these people what was it like working with Bela Lugosi because I was a big fan of his. Although he was the only one I never met. Wow! So I met everybody else. I was really lucky to do that. It was really oh, cool. okay. Okay, I gotta tell you, the whole thing is just like you've got to be kidding me. I'm so so envious. I can't even tell you what an opportunity. Oh, the I best had. thing was yeah, this house that we lived in. Was surround. It was a big. It was three and a half acres, but the house was like Downton Abbey, you know, where you mm -hmm. have a butler and a maid and the cook. And and my, par my parents, especially my dad, was so humble and sweet. He was not a stuffy guy, but th they were. They lived in this place and got into all of that. And you know, we went to private schools and things like that. Most of the time, everybody was really nice. We really had fun. But our neighborhood, we around this property, these were all next door neighbors was Alan Ladd, Lana Turner, oh. Judy Garland. I've spent a lot of time with Judy Garland. Um, uh, the people who owned the May Company, Floria Graham and Cy Howard, uh, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, oh, Sam Pond, the Sam, the songwriter, Carol Burnett, Jer Jerry Lewis, and Walt Disney. Now, Walt oh. Disney was a really good friend of ours. I spent a lot of time with him. He invited us to the opening as his guest of Disneyland, and we were standing about... 12, 13 feet away from him when he cut the ribbon to open Disneyland. Oh my gosh. And we used to go to his house on Carrollwood and ride around on that steam train. He had a thing called the Carrollwood Express. And we would used to, we were kids that would go over to Uncle Walt. Maybe you want everyone to call him Uncle Walt. And I spent a lot of time with him. What was he like? Uh, what, what, what was he like? Uh, I guess just, you know, not thinking of Walt Disney, the one we know from, you know, watching on TV, but what was he like, like when he was just in his yard or at his home? Casual, liked to, you know, spend time with his friends, loved everybody. And I'll tell you something really interesting about him. And even as a kid, you could spot it, was he was completely interested in what kids liked. He, like Price, he would say, um, so what movies do you guys like? Um, well, what cartoons do you watch? Um, you know, and if you said Bugs Bunny or something, it wasn't Disney, he didn't care. Um, mm -hmm. He said, um, what do you guys talk about at school? Because uh, he all he was focused, focused, focused on kids. And the funny thing is, my parents had a, 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 a huge number of friends. And as kids, we usually knew the the you know the the man and the woman. We knew the two, the married couple. So mm -hmm. if, if a guy showed up, if Bob Cummings showed up, we knew Mary Cummings would be there. If Art Linkletter showed up, we knew Lois would be there. 
Lillian Disney, I don't remember because all the time I spent with Disney, I was just tunnel vision. I don't remember her and she was always there. I just remember him. And I'll tell you something funny. I used to be, I'm, I'm the worst artist in the world still today. When I used to mark my scripts for camera blocking, I yeah. do it with stick people and the kids I was directing would come over and look and laugh. They always got a kick out of that because I was such a bad artist. So <laughs> I decided up when I was like six years old or something, I would, you know, draw some pictures for Walt Disney because he was at the house at a party, again, like where I met Carlisle, sitting on a bar stool at the bar. So I would draw these pictures for him. You know, they were terrible. And then he would say to me, oh, really good. Well, come here, let me show you something. He'd pick me up and put me on his lap. He'd take a pencil and a piece of school paper, like loose leaf, three ring paper. You know, remember the old- Yeah, totally, I could picture it. And he would take my hand and he'd draw Mickey, he'd draw Donald. And then I thought, well, this is so much fun. But then at the end of the evening, when I was like upstairs, the maids would come out and throw all of that stuff in the trash. Oh, wow. All these things done by Walt Disney. And I thought, and I did, nobody thought anything about it because you'd, you'd think, okay, well, the next time he's here, I'll have him do it again. But you just, I mean, you didn't think about that in those days. Wow. Um, so he was, he, he was another guy we spent a lot of time with. Very, very, very nice. And the other guy was Hoplon Cassidy, Bill Boyd. Yeah. This was the nicest guy in the world. And of course, we were, you know, everybody loved Hoppies because, you know, the guns and the cowboys. And he was the best. Had the best laugh ever. <laughs> Bill Boyd. I have 3D, stereo 3D, 35 millimeter pictures of me sitting on his lap. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, he was like a hero. Yeah, without a doubt. What a couple of things. I mean, I love your stories. Like I said, I and just so everybody knows at the top of this, I even told Rich, we may have to do two episodes because he's just got too much good stuff. Um you mentioned uh, Lori uh, Price and uh, Rathbone. A couple things did, or actually Lori Price and, uh, oh, geez, I'd like, oh, and Carla, duh. Um, they all had that distinct voice, you know? Um, when you first met them, was it kind of wild to hear like, you know, that Boris Karloff voice or that kind of higher Peter Lori voice or Vincent Price? Was it kind of like wild to hear that, not really, because as film stars, you got to remember one of <laughs> Karloff, you know, basically the monster was his most famous role. But that role, aside from Bride of Frankenstein, where he kind of grunts words, mm -hmm. he didn't talk. So in The Mummy, he talks the black cat, the raven. We knew what he sounded like. And so mm -hmm. he sounded exactly, you know, The Invisible Ray, all of those movies that he did for Universal we knew exactly what he sounded like. And he sounded like what he sounded like. I mean, the guy in The Mummy, who talked all the time, that's what he sounded like. And Peter Lorre, of course, everybody was always imitating Peter Lorre. Totally. And, but he, when he talked to you, that's what he sounded like. And, and Price, the same thing. It was not, it's not like they were doing a character and, and doing the voice. Right. Of that's who they really were. That's just fascinating. The other thing, too, you mentioned Humphrey Bogart and Laura McCall. Were they ever there? Oh, sure. But my, but you know, what's funny about um, Bogart, Bogart died when he was 57 years old and he was mm -hmm. born in 1901. So when I would go over to his house, like this would be 55, 56, it was obviously much later in his life. Mm -hmm. He wasn't by today's standards, very old, but I always remember him being bald and kind of sick. And a couple of times I went over to see um, Stephen Bogart and he was, uh, Humphrey Bogart was in a wheelchair. And I remember, he wasn't anything like Rick from Casablanca. I don't remember. I mean, the, the horror guys were very vital. Mm -hmm. you know, Harloff was you know, really vital and Bryce was great. Yeah. Rathbone was really a nice guy. Kind of. A yeah, I want to hear about him too. Well, I, I'm a huge Sherlock. I have all of those on DVD. I, yeah, me I'm too. a huge Sherlock Holmes fan. Me too. I love those. But um, I don't remember. I'm, I remember that Bacall was very young compared to him and and he was not he was never vital when i saw him when i would be at his house because he lived you know i could climb the fence and go to his house so yeah. everybody the, the neighborhood kids were kind of welcome because he had kids kind of our age but i don't remember him ever being a vital guy i didn't know him like like the way he was in casablanca interesting he interesting. was a chain smoker he would light one cigarette with the next cigarette, even when he had cancer. Wow. 
Wow. And what about Basil Rathbone? I mean, come on. I'm sorry. There's another one. Just that voice, that 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 demeanor. Basil Rathbone was like to us, you know, <clears throat> did we know him? No. Did we meet him? Yeah. I mean, I met Elvis before he went in the army. Wow. And he, Elvis was the only person who at a young age said, called me, sir. It was like, I'd say, so like, do you like doing records? He'd go, he'd go, I do, sir. And I'd like go, who's he talking to? And I was a little kid, um, <laughs> but he was very, very, very sweet. Now, Rathbone was extremely formal. So meeting him, the handshake was pretty strong. He kind of looked you up and down, great distinctive voice. I told him that I loved Adventures of Robin Hood. And he thought oh. that was great because he he loved that movie. Thought that yeah. was a good movie. Um, I heard him say in interviews later, "Well, I was a real swordsman, and Flynn wasn't, so I could have killed him any time I wanted." But he didn't say that to me. Um, <laughs> I told him I liked that. I don't know if I mentioned Sherlock Holmes. And you know the thing that was really great about Rathbone, who I, I, I he's literally <clears throat> one of my favorite character actors, if not the favorite, because here was a guy who in his career played these terrible, terrible villains. Mm -hmm. And then he turned around and played like the best hero. And everybody bought it. If you went to the movies <laughs> to see him as, as Sherlock Holmes, you totally bought it. Totally. Seeing this guy of Gisborne, you totally bought it. Mm -hmm. So I told him I really liked Robin Hood and some of the other films, probably Son of Frankenstein. He said, oh yeah, I, was, I worked with that gentleman over there on that. And he's pointing to Carlisle. So, but you know, that was the thing where, hi, how are you? Fine. Doing great? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, I hear, hey, I'm a fan of yours. I like this. Oh, great. Okay, thanks. Great. Okay, well, see ya. I mean, I, <laughs> look, I met him. I, Cheney Jr. was a guy that I actually sat down and talked to. Oh, but, really? I mean, Rathbone was, hi, how are you? See you later. Yeah. Karloff and Price were not like that, especially Price. Wow. Price always thought he'd be shortchanging a fan if he didn't talk to him. Price would literally cross the street in a pouring rainstorm to say hello to one fan. Wow. This is one of the nicest people ever. God, he was a great guy. So sweet. Such a nice guy. Yeah, I had, uh, I just, I actually just released this episode with Lloyd Schwartz. And Lloyd Schwartz had Vincent Price on, on the Brady Bunch Hawaii episodes. And he was saying almost identical what you said, what a great guy it was. He said that it blew him away. He shows up on the set. And he would go early, Lloyd. And he said, Vincent Price was there. He was the first guy on the set already. And he was all ready to go. And, and he was like, uh, hi. <laughs> you know, and, and he's pro. That, he was a pro. pro. And everybody who worked with Vincent Price, no matter, I, there's another guy who played tons of villains. Everybody who worked with him thought he was like super nice. Yeah. Gene, Gene Tierney loved him. Just absolutely loved him. Gene Tierney, really? He loved him. And he was always, you know, trying to kill her or push her down the stairs or hide in her body or whatever the hell it was. Yeah. And she said, Oh, this was literally the nicest guy ever knew everything about art. Very, very sophisticated, very well-spoken, but even the people, you know, on house of wax, they loved it. They thought he was the best. They, wow. They that's amazing. All the time. wow. Was it hey, just out of curiosity, total random question, <clears throat> just because you were in that society, more or less that Holmby Hill society. Was Groucho Marx ever around for any of those parties? Well, you know, I wrote a book about my life. Uh -huh. and I'm, I finished it about 10 months ago. <laughs> and I was offered a publishing deal from someone who I didn't think was a really strong publisher. I realized I'm not going to make money on a book, but I do want to go out and talk. And tour yeah, and you should. And I worked for Groucho Marx for two years. I saw him all the time. What? Now that I never read about. What? Yeah. Um, in 1970, I think it was, I think it was like 70, 71. A friend of mine named Richard Simonton and another friend named Bob Epstein were starting the UCLA Film Archive because Paramount had announced they were going to junk all their nitrate studio prints. Jeez. And these guys went, no, 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 no. Don't do that. We'll take them. And so this is how... The UCLA Film Archive started long before Packard got involved. Wow. David Packard. And so Rich said to me, you want to help us move stuff? Because we're going to move it from the studio to this, you know, refrigerated storage. And I said, sure. So 
because I was because I knew Harold Lloyd, I was his film curator. Yeah, so I can't I, wait to hear about that. I, I wanted to ask you about Lloyd. Tons of nitrate film, so I was always transferring nitrate to safety. I knew how to work step printers and projectors and all of that stuff. So I was a pr preservationist anyway. <clears throat> so I said, sure, I'll help. <clears throat> well, in that collection was a print of Animal Crackers, and which was the second movie that they made. It was their movie after Coconut. So it was 1930. Yeah. Well, Animal Crackers had been tied up with some legal problems for years. So when the Paramount package was sold over and over, all the Marx Brothers films, they never, they never included animal crackers. And so Groucho was at the Academy doing some sort of appearance. I'm not shy. I was in the audience. So I went down after the thing to talk to him. People were saying, oh, don't bother me. I said, no. So I snuck around and I was going to come in and see him. And I said, I finally got right next to him. I said, Groucho. My name's Rich Carell, never heard of you. You know, he did his thing. I said, my father was Charlie Carell of Amos Nanny. He went, oh, I know your father pretty well. When we were kids, the Marx Brothers would come over for dinner. Oh, and come on. So we knew, and I said, you know, Charlie Carell's my dad. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, look, I want to know if you want to come out to a friend's house. A friend, this guy, Simonton, had a 35 millimeter, 90 seat theater in his house. I said, I want you to, I want to know if you want to come out and see uh, any of your movies. I can get any of your movies. And he said, well, you can't get any of them. Uh, not all of them. I bet there's one you can't get. And I said, what's that? And he said, Animal Crackers. Now, Animal Crackers, I had personally put the print on a shelf. I, I knew where it was. Oh, and wow. I, I said, oh, yes, I can. He said, you can get Animal Crackers? I said, yes. He said, I haven't seen it since we made it. Oh, wow. I said, I'll screen it for you in the Valley. When do you want to come? He said, well, this is Saturday night. I'm going to come next Saturday. I went, okay. I gave him my phone number. I exchanged the phone number. So I went to the Simon, Simonton house and I said, look, Groucho Marx wants to come down and see Animal Crackers. Can we run it? They said, of course. A lot of their friends were film buffs. And it was just every Saturday night they'd have a screening. So everyone got all excited. So I said, Groucho's coming. Oh, and Groucho said, where do you live? And I said, I live in Truesdale. And he said, can you pick me up? And I said, sure. So right around Wednesday, everybody's all excited and getting ready for Groucho Marx. Wednesday or Thursday, we the phone rang and it was Groucho Marx and I went, oh boy, I bet he's going to cancel. Watch him cancel. <laughs> and instead of canceling, he said, he goes, Rich, what kind of car do you have? And I oh said, no, you're kidding me. I said, I have, I don't know, I drive a Chevy Super Sport or 396. Or he said, well, you got room for more people? And I went, sure. He said, I'm, I want to invite two guys down there with me. And I went, okay, no problem. You're still coming to pick me up? Yep. All right, the screening starts at eight, pick us up at like 6.30 or seven. Okay, I'll be there. Saturday night comes along. I go up to Groucho's house, ring the doorbell, and Groucho says, ah, oh, we're gonna go. Here's these two guys. It was Elton John and Bernie Taubin. Oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Elton had just released uh, your song. So he wasn't the superstar yet, but he was still, he was just breaking. Oh, wow. I wanted them to go see this movie. So I got in this kind of beat up car. I'm driving down to Luke Lake with Groucho Marx, Elton John, and Bernie Taubin in the car. <laughs> I show up. We have a great evening. We run Animal Crackers. He answers questions about it. So he says to me, hey, how did you get these films? And I said, well, this guy, Richard Simonton, is taking care of all the Paramount films. And he said, I'm doing a concert tour called An Evening with Groucho. I want you guys, I want you boys to work for me. And we said, oh, wow, okay, so what do you want us to do? And he said, I want you to put film clips together. And we went, OK, <clears throat> he suggested some stuff. I suggested some stuff. And I ended up working for him, supplying him with the 35 millimeter reels of clips that he used during the evening with Groucho. So not only did we see him as kids and my mother hated him because he was always insulting her friends, which I thought was hilarious. And my dad <laughs> loved him. He was always smoking a cigar. My mom hated cigars and he was always insulting people. And my father thought he was hilarious. And my mom was like, why are you insulting our friends? Oh God. So I had a lot, I spent a lot of time with Groucho. Lots of time. Much more, more than the others. The others came around, you know, we, you, we used to see Zeppo Mark, which a lot of really? people don't remember much about him. And by the way, Harpo Mark, who would show up for dinner, he could do all that crazy stuff like a magician, so we loved them as kids.
but he was almost bald and spoke just as much as you and I do. So this oh. thing in the movie, it wasn't that guy. Right, 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 right. Plus, he, I mean, I, that's another one, by the way. I've heard nicest guy in the world. I've heard that oh, yeah. Harpo. Harpo was a, a the whole group of them. Um, Harpo was probably the nicest. And the thing that people don't realize <laughs> is of the three Marx brothers, the ones that were really famous, Harpo, Chico, and Groucho. Groucho's the youngest, even though he was playing their fathers oh, yeah. sometimes. Yeah, I that's right. Hilarious. I think that's really funny. Oh, yeah. And and Harpo also, I mean, incredibly intelligent. He was part of that, like, uh, oh God, I'm blanking out, but in New York, that were there was that famous uh, group of people that would come together. They were like writers and whatever. And he was brought in with them. I mean, it's a really famous, oh, can't think of it right now, but great. I mean, I love hearing that. That's just I saw, super. Cool. I saw him do that thing with a cigarette where he would inhale and then blow uh, like a bubble. He could do a bubble. I don't know how he did it. And, you know, his kids were like, oh, look at that. And he was like, a he did like magic and stuff. Wow. Very, very, very nice guy. But wow. nothing, nothing like the guy in the movies. I mean, right. he talks as much as you and I talk, you know? Yeah. So yeah. was Groucho in that time that you were working with him? Because, of course, we always know like that, just like you said, it's like, well, I don't know. What do you think? You know, that whole thing. Was he like that when you would just be, you know, working with him? Or was he more, you know, normal? Or was he always in that kind of state the thing i remember the most about groucho is he was really fascinated and almost amazed that any young people would know about their films and the history of film i was walking in his house and he had like a rogues gallery he had a hallway with all these pictures in it and this wow. is when, with Erin fleming by the way who yeah, was very sure. nice him. she was very nice to him um hmm. and i saw a picture of them putting their hands and feet at the in the cement of the chinese theater of the of the four of them. This is when Zeppo was with them. Right. <laughs> and I looked and I said, Oh, look, this picture was taken like in June 33. You guys had just left the set of horse feathers and you're still in wardrobe from that movie. That's when you signed this thing. And he was like, How would you ever know that? And I, you know what? Millions of film fans would know that. Mm -hmm. The TCM thing that's going on right now, half that half the people going there would have known that. But he was su surprised that a young person would have that much knowledge or even care that much about the history of those movies because a lot of those guys later on I think Groucho felt that the most famous thing he did was this uh you bet your life mm. I think he thinks that's the most famous thing he did mm -hmm. and you know you can watch on cable old time shows that have old tv shows and see it and it's pretty good oh it's, yeah it's always funny but that no, I, I love the Paramount movies. I love them. Oh, I loved all the Marx Brothers movies. I Even Night in Casablanca, which is one of their last movies, I thought was really funny. Um, oh, yeah. But he, I think he thought, oh, I'm a television star, not so much a movie star. And I think that's kind of strange. That is very strange. No, I've, I've been a huge fan since I was a little kid. But he always was yeah. quipping. He was always quipping. He was never not on, even okay. if you were alone with him. That's what I was wondering. That's what I was wondering. That's the impression I got. That's very interesting. Wow. There was always a great story about uh, the four of them with, uh, I think it was um, Irving Thalberg. Oh, yeah. The fire. Yeah. The fire. And it, he wow. walks in, they're all naked. And they're oh, all I totally believe the fire. that. I totally believe that. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds exactly like something they would do. And and Chico Marx was as much up to mischief as anybody else. He thought of all kinds of crazy stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, because, I mean, everybody, you know, you hear about, you know, I, I still love watching him play the piano, and I know he had his gambling problems and that, but I, he looks like he was always like a, you know, a shyster, you know what I mean, that that kind of guy. Yeah, yeah, but that's, I think that's totally true. I mean, the th the Thalberg story, and they did that because he was late, Thalberg was late. That's right, that's exactly they, right. They, they waited and waited and waited, then they got pissed. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I, I don't know if you knew, but like I used to go visit Stan Laurel on Sunday afternoons. Oh, wait, when he had a place on Ocean Boulevard or whatever? That's right, the Oceana Hotel. Ocean yeah. Apartment, sorry. Yeah, second oh. floor. I used to okay, go see tell him. tell me about that, please. Well, <clears throat> that was the best. Uh, Stan Laurel, because of who I was brought up with and because of the people we were around, I was never nervous of movie stars or whatever. I mean, TV stars, never. Mm -hmm. The only star I was ever nervous to meet was Stan Laurel because he was such a big star to me. 
I mean, growing up, I guess I thought he was the biggest star in the world. Laurel and Hardy. I still love Laurel and Hardy. I just loved them. And and yeah. we we were asking our parents and Rob Foster's parents, <clears throat> can we meet him? Can we meet him? Can we meet him? <laughs> and they would say, yeah, we'll arrange it. We'll get it going. Um, we'll figure it out. But they kind of were stalling, stalling, stalling. And one day, Rob comes to me and goes, hey, I want to show you something. I said, what's that? He said, look at this. Santa Monica phone book, the white pages. Laurel, Stan. <laughs> We were like, no, 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 no. He can't be in the phone book. So I said, I'm going to call him up. I we, we should call him up and see if it's really him or if we should uh, and maybe make an appointment to come and see him and stuff. And they went, and there were three of us and everybody, I don't know. It was, he was such a big star. They said, okay, you rich, you're, you're the, we'll be on the extension line, but you talk to him because everybody's kind of nervous. Yeah. So I call up Stan Laurel. And here's how this phone call goes. <laughs> the phone rings and this voice goes, hello? And I went, Mr. <laughs> Laurel? Yes. The Mr. Laurel? Well, I hope so. I'm the only one here. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, Mr. Laurel, my name is Rich Carell. Never heard of you. <laughs> oh, no, see, I'm, um, I'm, I'm calling so that I can come and see you. How can you call me and see me at the same time? <laughs> Look, I'm a fan, uh, and I want to make an appointment. Well, I'm not a dentist. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm a fan, and I, I want to make a. Um, I just want to come down and make an appointment, and I want to see you, and I want to see if we can come and see you, and this is why I'm calling. And then he little waited and went, "Well, why didn't you say so?" It's so <laughs> funny, and it, and it's it was perfect. It was as perfect. It, it was the voice. The voice was yeah. exactly the same. Exactly. So wow. we made an appointment and we went down to see him and um, he got to be a friend of ours. And when, and when you were friendly with Stan, he would mail you stuff. Like I have stuff he sent me in letters. We, I'd be home and my mom would go, Hey, you got some mail. And it would say Rich Carell. And then the return address would be Stan Laurel, you know, Oceana. Oh, come like, on. Oh God. So, and then we would sit and talk to him for hours. He remembered everything. He remembered everything about all the movies. Wow. And this was 63, oh. 63, 64. He died in February 65. So we knew him for about two years. We give him Christmas presents and he called us on our birthdays. It was unbelievable. Oh, Rich, I just, I cannot tell you wow, how much that means. That's so cool. It's so funny. Oh. And you know, that routine on the phone, he probably did that to everybody that called him. You know, yeah. he had it yeah. down. He had it down. Oh, that's just cool. I remember, I, I can't remember if, I know that Johnny Carson had him on and I know that that was a really cool thing. They kind of brought him back out of nowhere, you know, type of thing. He was always a big fan. And Carson was almost like, it was like hard. Like he was, a, he was such a fan of his too. But um, I had heard, I'm not sure if it was in that interview or what I've read, that he spent his days at his typewriter answering fan mail. That's personally. what he did. Yep, manual typewriter. He would sit and work a manual typewriter and write to all of his fans. And this went on and on and on and on. And he was so gracious, always happy to see people, always happy to see people. Wow. And you know, Stan, I don't know. You know, what's really strange is there's been some really kind of tragic things about famous comedians and how they perceived who they were and what they did when they got older. The worst was Curly Howard. Curly died when he was very, very young. He was only 46 years old when he died. Yeah, He died, um, he had to retire from the act because of health problems, but he died thinking, no one's gonna remember me, no one's gonna remember the act. You know, mm -hmm. he, they had not sold the movies to TV, that he was kind of living in oblivion. And for someone as talented as Curly Howard, I mean, there was a time in the late 50s when those, show, those films came back on TV where every kid, I knew was imitating Curly Howard. If you went out to the schoolyard, mm -hmm. you'd hear people going, woo, 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 woo. And, I mean, it was, every, the whole world loved him. And he he never lived long enough to know that. And Oliver Hardy, <clears throat> who died in August 57, I think he realized that the, the resurgence of their movies on TV made him popular again. But I don't think he died ever realizing exactly how popular he would have been.
Yeah, you know, it's funny. I think that that tour that they did in England, you know, I know they made a movie of it and everything else, but I think one thing that probably was one of the best benefits of that is that when they arrived and these overwhelming crowds were there to meet them, at, whether it be a train station off the boat, I think that that, you know, might have been that like moment of like for him, wow, we really did do this, you know, like. When I, when I met Stan and this was, I had been watching Stan literally since the time I was a four-year-old, <laughs> watching him on TV. And my friends loved him. My sisters loved Laurel and Hardy. Everybody loved Laurel and Hardy. And I think he only lived through part of that. I think he realized, yeah, people still like us. But mm -hmm. by 1960, even before I met Stan, they were megastars as far as kids were concerned. Mm -hmm. It was the Stooges and Laurel and Hardy. Yep. And you know, Abbott and Costello were a huge, huge act. They were number one box office during the war years. Sure. But, but Laurel and Hardy had much more of a presence on television because mm -hmm. they made so many shorts. That's right. I don't think they that Hardy knew how big he was. And I think Stan did. Stan knew. Curly yeah. Howard never, Curly Howard never knew. And and Larry Fine and Mo Howard really knew because not only did they live through that complete renaissance of their stuff but then they capitalized on it and started making movies and appearances and they were completely reborn you know it was like oh great but right it's, sad, it's yeah. sad, really sad about curly howard jerry his name is jerry howard it's too bad because he never realized it and i think oliver kind of realized it and then yeah, got think... sick for a year and a half and i just think he just didn't realize the, the size of his success oh yeah no yeah, I know, I know. You and I could talk for hours about Stan Laurel and and uh, Laurel and Hardy. Believe me, I, I the fact that Laurel, uh, Stan Laurel, and Charlie Chaplin were in like the same comedy troupe is yeah. like mind boggling. They came over on the same boat. Yeah, I mean, come on, that's just like crazy stuff that that yeah. happened. But um, okay, I'll tell you what, because I know the Leave It to Beaver fans are probably going, okay, I love all this stuff, but hey, wait, I want more about Leave It to Beaver, or whatever. Um, I did want to know when you were with Jerry, because you guys were tight, you're out in public. I know that was a different time than now, you know, obviously, but was that ever an issue? Because obviously you guys were buds and, you, you know, you're going to do stuff like kids and go to the movies or go play ba baseball. Was that ever an issue with like people noticing you? No, I don't think it was an issue. I think people noticed Jerry. I don't know uh -huh. if they noticed me so much, but they noticed Jerry all the time. And, you know, like kids or somebody go, hey, hey, there's Beaver. But most of the time, people left you alone. They were pretty mm -hmm. polite in Beverly Hills and Westwood, um, other parts of L.A. I mean, people were kind of used to movie stars. So I think that it didn't bother us. I mean, Jerry and I never did not go someplace because of problems with fans. If we wanted to do something, we did it. Wow. Wow. We to go to a concert, if we want to go to a movie, if we want to go to dinner, <laughs> we just did it. And I think that everybody, I think everybody was great you know john provost is a friend of mine from lassie he was somebody oh john's been on way, john's he, been on he, he caused more of a stir than jerry did really yeah i mean he was a huge star and that tv show i mean lassie was huge yeah yeah I just, yeah he was he was somebody that everybody recognized he could and it was just you know people went crazy over these guys but but it wasn't we wouldn't not i mean if we were the beatles you can't go to disneyland you know? right Right. You can't go out to dinner at some place. I mean, but no, that that didn't affect us. We were we were fine with all that stuff. And what about what about the other cast? Obviously, the one that, by the way, I personally regret terribly that I did not interview. Um, and a lot of that had to do with timing and pandemic and that. But it's Tony Dow. Um, what was your you know what was it like with Tony or or Ken Osmond? What was your relationship with them like? People ask me about that all the time. And the only thing I can tell you is those guys were such good guys. And I'll tell you something. The we when you're 10 and those guys are 13, or when we're 12 and they're 15 or whatever, turning 16 mm -hmm. driving, there's that's a huge gap. It they is blown us off and said, eh, you know, they're the little kids. Who cares? Never. They were out shooting hoops with us. We went to the movies with them. Went over to Tony's house for parties. Ken, who played that sleazy character, was absolutely the opposite. The nicest guy. Ken was a sweet guy. Frank Bank was really nice. Uh, Tony was fantastic. And I loved 
to be around Tony because Tony was like, you know, one step short of like a professional diver. Yeah, yeah. Well, and he was a, a gymnast and I was a gymnast. He was oh. a lot better than me, but he showed me how to do flip flops and round offs and stuff like that. And he was really good. He was like a great tumbler. He's almost like a stunt man. But those guys who could have been not nasty, but who could have been, eh, you know, they're the little kids. Let's go do something else. Mm -hmm. Everybody was a group. Everybody was nice. And we hung out with those guys too. Ken Osmond was really funny to go to the movies with because he always had quips. He was funny in a movie. He was very smart, really smart. Wow. And there's wow. a guy who was recognized because the most famous character on the show was Eddie Asker. Yeah. Everybody yeah, knew who Eddie Asker was. But again, I have nothing but nice things to say about them. Hugh Beaumont was a guy who would come out always in a suit and tie, like Ward. He'd come out and sit in the camera aisle with the paper. He'd be sitting, you know, Mr. Beaumont, his chair, and he'd be reading the paper. <laughs> Time for you to do a scene. He'd go into the scene, go back and read the paper, scene over, he'd go back to his dressing room. We didn't have a lot of interaction with him, although I was in several of the episodes he directed, and I thought he was a pretty good director. Um, but I liked him too. You know, I asked him about some old movies he had made, one called The Lost Continent. He went, oh, that, I was on a rock. We were on a rock the whole time. They built a set and we were on a climbing of the mountain. <laughs> I should have asked him about Objective Burma and things like that. That would have been really cool. But that didn't happen. So he was he was nice, but kind of, yeah, the kids are over here. I'll do my thing. Barbara was opposite. Mm -hmm. Barbara was the den mother. Barbara wanted to get involved and help everybody and be nice to everybody and bring cookies. And when I first started Beaver, I think I had done two episodes and we were coming up on Christmas break and, and they were having a party and, you know, Stanley and, and uh, Steve Talbot and Rusty Stevens, they had all been there a lot much. I mean, I was just getting there new mm -hmm. and, and she was handing out presents to people. And I thought, Oh, what a nice thing. Well, I haven't been here long enough for her to do that. And she, just like someone who had been there for three years, he was, no, Richard, can I have something for you? And it's the same thing the other kids, they were like, we we're making model kits of cars and stuff. It was like, that was so sweet. I couldn't believe that. Wow. I had just gotten there and she was just, she was the best. Absolutely the best. Just, I mean, that sounds like Mrs. Cleaver. <laughs> she was Mrs. Cleaver. God, that's amazing. Um, so the other one that you mentioned, I, and by the way, for all the Beaver fans, I, I I hope we got some good stuff there because I love it all. But I love, you know, it's I think it's important to point out you were a great friend of Harold Lloyd and you were, his, as you mentioned earlier, uh, you were the archivist for his collection. I, I having, like I said, I, you can tell I'm a fan of that time, you know, as much as anybody. And I know how big that estate was that he had. Um what was that like? Can you tell me how you met him? How that all, you know, just what, what what was he like? What was it like working on those films? All that. Well, my father, when Amos and Andy used to broadcast from Chicago and the winter time would kill everybody because it was so cold. They were at the, my dad lived at the Drake Hotel, so he was right on the lake. So yeah. I mean, it to be like, you know, 12 below zero and it's terrible. And Freeman hated that weather. So they decided that during the winters, in Illinois, they would come to Palm Springs, California. And in Palm Springs, my dad was in with a group of people and they, there was a colony down there, like the Malibu colony. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Marlena Dietrich and Charlie Winninger and Cecil B. DeMille, Harold Lloyd. They were all they all had homes down there. So they all started to hang out. My dad thought that Harold Lloyd was one of the nicest people ever. Now, this was in the mid to late 30s. And then dad moved out here to live here in 1937. That's when he built the house that we lived in. And in 1940, Paul Whiteman, Bing Crosby, Gosden and Carell and Harold Lloyd started KMPC Radio, <laughs> which was a big radio station out here. So they were kind of partners. So he always knew Harold Lloyd. Harold Lloyd was the leading 3D photographer in the United States during the um, late 40s, early 50s, and through the 50s and 60s. But hmm. he always had these parties about 3D and Art Linkletter and um, Frank Capra and a, a bunch of people that shot 3D. My dad would go to the Lloyd house for parties and things and 3D stuff. Hmm. So I always saw this house from driving up and down Benedict. And this place was Xanadu. It was like, just what is that? This great big property. Huge. 17 and a half acres. And so I was always say to my mom and dad, who? He said, that's Harold Lloyd, who's 
Carol Lloyd's house, he was one of the wealthiest or is one of the wealthiest people in Hollywood. And my mom would always go. And by the way, it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. He was so nice. My wow. parents told me that. So one day in 1966, a friend of mine had been invited to a party up there thrown by Lloyd's granddaughter, Suzanne. And Suzanne was, um, I think, about three years younger than me. Hmm. <laughs> so I heard he was going to go up there and I said, I'm going to go with you. He said, great. And I said, do you think they'll be pissed off if I crash this party? And he said, no, just come. There's so many people. It's such a big place. They won't know. Just come with me. So basically, I crashed the party. Now, I went there for two reasons. The first reason was I went there to see this fabulous house because I had heard so much about it. Yeah. And trust me, it didn't disappoint anybody. It was Xanadu. And I'm not wow. kidding. But the second reason I went is I wanted to meet Harold Lloyd because in 1961, I went to see his compilation movie, Harold Lloyd's World of Comedy. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was sensational. Huh. So this was like five years later. So I went. So the party goes on and it's rock and roll and it's down at a place called the pavilion which was next to the pool biggest pool in beverly hills two hundred and seventy thousand gallons of water oh and my gosh it's like a river um and then it, halfway through the party here comes harold lloyd and i knew who he was so i went up to him and i said mr lloyd my name's rich Carroll. my dad's charlie Carroll. oh charlie's a good friend of mine welcome welcome and i said hey i want to tell you something <clears throat> i said harold lloyd's world of comedy is the only movie that I ever paid to see twice in the same day. Because it was the truth. I had gone in the afternoon, went home. My sister said, I'd like to see something really funny. And then my sister and I went back and I said, you got to see this movie. Wow. Paid to see it twice in one day. We were like fast friends after that. So I got to know him <clears throat> that way. And then I started dating the granddaughter. And then I started realizing that we asked him one day, can we see Welcome Danger? This was his first talking movie that was made in 1929. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, yeah, sure, boys, because he loved young people, especially if you liked, he was like Groucho. He was surprised that you knew about him in all his films. And uh. stuff. So he asked us to go to, uh, he said, come down with me. I have to go to one of the film vaults and pick up the print. He had seven walk-in film vaults on the, on the property. Oh, my gosh. So oh we God. went down there, <laughs> and I and a friend of mine named David Knoll, we, we realized that, after the second compilation he had made in the early 60s, the negatives were kind of in the same place with the positives and the nitrate was intermixed with the safety. And, and we said to him, hey, Mr. Lloyd, we will be happy to put your collection back in order for you. Um, he the only one other person that had the keys to the Lloyd collection in history, a guy named Jack Murphy. Wow. And that was it. And he went, OK, if you guys would do that for me, I mean, do you know what you're doing? I said, yeah, we know exactly what we're doing. We can do it. And he went, okay, well, I'll pay you to do it. Now, we never asked him to pay us. And we went, oh, my God. So we would go down, like on a Sunday afternoon, we'd be going through a nitrate vault. He would come down, bring lemonade down in like a director's chair and sit in this grape arbor. And off to the side was like one of the film vaults. Oh. We would like pull out a reel of like, why worry? And he'd go, oh, why worry? Okay, that's the last movie I made for Roach. I made it in 1923. We had a new leading lady that we brought in for that film. And so I'm doing on the job training. Wow. Working, not only holding the film in my hands, but next to Harold Lloyd, who made the movie. Oh, uh, that's it's just incredible. The luckiest thing ever. So I got to be like a Lloyd expert. My my career with him as a nitrate guy, I became like a nitrate film expert. I was, I mean, I was like 18, 17, 18. And oh, I gosh. do all this preservation work. Uh, all the guys at the lab, CFI and photo camera, they all knew me because we were restoring all these movies for him. And I mean, he was literally like one of my best friends. And and he was never, he was like the guy he played in the movies. He was always this kind of perennial young guy. Oh, wow. So being up there <laughs> at the house, dating the granddaughter, coming up <laughs> just Harold. When we have more time, I'll tell you more stories about the house and all. I've got to jump in a second here because I've got okay. to no problem at all. Rich, uh, make me a promise. You're coming back because we're going to set up another time. Well, I, we have a lot more to talk about. We have a ton to talk about. And talk I, to you I about the Gary Marshall days and <laughs> Happy Days in Laverne and Shirley and all the sitcoms and Hannah Montana and all the stuff at Disney. And, oh, you know, I, there's, I a mean, ton of stuff. there's so much stuff that I, I, I have. But like I told you at the start of the interview, I knew it because you just are incredible. I love it. So, um, hey, thanks a bunch for being here on this on this episode of That's Classic. But I really look forward to talking to you. I really do. It's just it's just been a ball.
Okay, man. Well, I'm happy to do it and call me again. Always have fun with someone who has your kind of enthusiasm. Plus, you know about all these movies. When I talk yeah. about name a movie, it's like, you know what I'm talking about. So I love stuff like that. Thanks, okay, man. you got it. It's been a total pleasure. All right, man. Thank you. See you. Well, thanks for listening and definitely hit the subscription button. As well, hit the notification bell so that you'll know when my next episode is released. In addition, check out some of my other interviews if you haven't had a chance. Eric Roberts, Henry Winkler, Jerry Mathers from Leave it to Beaver. There's so many. Enjoy.